Welcome everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Adam Archer. I am uh, host of this uh, session along with Cecil Mack. Um, welcome to the, the ninth uh, annual Vietnam Tech Conference. Um, Saigon South International School is honored to be hosting it uh, along in collaboration with Eunice Hanoi. Uh, it's my honor to welcome Cecil Mack, uh, who will be talking to us about the impact and playful opportunities of future technologies. Uh, Cecil is a secondary school tech innovation coach at uh, Eunice Hanoi, United Nations International School of Hanoi. Uh, his goal is to connect student solutions to sustainable development goals using technology as an enhancement, uh, the opportunities to connect students to the real world, be creative, and work with incredible international staff has made this lifestyle something he's happy about. So it's my pleasure to welcome Cecil. Uh, over to you. Thank you so much, Adam. And uh, thank you again for uh, everybody at Saigon South. Um, it's been an awesome opportunity and certainly been happy to uh, be a part of this once again. So let's see, uh, let me just go ahead and open up my presentation. Um, and of course, along the way, we're going to have a couple stops where people can write questions in the chat, um, and I will try to address those as they happen. Uh, and just going to try to keep up with the people that are being admitted. So um, just some things we are going to be covering today. i um, going to talk about like Padlet and my obsession, probably, of how useful and collaborative it is. Uh, we're going to talk about artificial intelligence and talking about how it's really going to be connected to a lot of things, uh, every industry, especially the, what we studied in university, but then what the students are going to be studying uh, going into future uh, educational areas. And then um, we'll talk about Teachable Machine, which is a fun little project that uh, some of my students did. And of course, um, if you ever have any questions, you can always find me on Twitter, Cecil W. Mac. But let's move forward. Okay. So um, when we started the school year, we started the school year on campus and I noticed that, you know, people had, they were excited. Um, one of the units that our middle school program does is a raising ducks unit, uh, talking about what do they do? How do you observe them? What are some of their traits? Um, and so I thought this was a really cool project. So I kind of took it upon myself to start recording and asking the IT office, can we do live streams of the ducks because of social distancing, we had to actually keep some distance from um, you know, the middle school to the other students. And so we actually had a live stream of Duck Watch uh, 2020. And it was one of those things I decided to put that into um, Padlet as a time stream. So that way people could follow the ducks, see you know, them being hatched to them uh, being able to start moving around and then learning how to swim and then care of ducks, and then eventually their um, support, their uh, movement into a life outside the school. But um, it was one of those things that I thought it was super delightful and fun to watch the um, primary students come and visit. And of course that connects to SCG 15, Life on Land. And um, I thought, you know, that's, it was a great way to start the school year because it connects the community, but also we had to be respectful of social distancing. And um, Padlet was a great way to just have it uh, be shared so people could track it as well. Another um, one of my favorites is um, whenever, I, as a tech coach, I, I meet with a teacher, I try to think about, well, there's a lot of endorse apps we have at the school, which are the ones that we consider the most important. There's the ones that we, we vetted them, we know that they're useful, we have a, a bunch of different ways, a lot of our teachers are specialized in those, but we also think about, well, what are some other technologies that could be useful? And so what I did was I, I tried to put everything into columns of every technology we have at the school. And so this can be Lego Mindstorms, it can be music production, it can be video production, it could be coding, it could be um, hand, you know, uh, hands-on type things like uh, make do or um, Legos. And so um, we had, I created uh, what we call the discovery wall. And so literally every column is devoted to a different technology that we have at the school. And um, with those endorse apps, with those platforms beyond our doors, um, endorse apps, every column always has a, a tutorial on what it is, project ideas, and then potential uses that they could be used in the classroom. And this is, that is safe, this is appropriate for both students and teachers. 
as a way of visually being able to see all the different things that could be, and then trying to find their favorite. And so this is where we start as like, this is the menu. This is all the options of everything we could possibly do. And then what we try to think about is, well, where could this apply? How could this be used? And not just as a replacement to something, but as an enhancement. So when I ask my students, what is their favorite SDG, sustainable goal? Um, I try to think about, well, which one of these tools would be best equipped to explain an idea that you have or to be able to actually potentially fix that solution? And so um, with teachers, this is where usually I talk about, well, okay, you want to do this. These are the tools that could be used. And then, well, let's try and play and figure out which one's going to be the best. So if you want to go to that Padlet right now, you can. Uh, you should be able to. Um, if anyone has any connection issues, just please write in the chat, but it's padlet.com slash unis slash discovery. And again, it's, it's, it's something that you can literally copy and create your own, but it's been a work in progress for a couple of years. Um, next, uh, so when we went to distance learning, I realized that the discovery wall is too much and it's all about different technologies, but maybe there could be something better just for distance learning. Uh, we had uh, what we call the bridge program, which was an orientation for our new students. And so we created a Padlet that had different columns for different subjects within um, distance learning. And so this is curated from a couple of different sources. Um, a lot of people who love Padlet uh, did kind of the same thing. And this is kind of a collection of a bunch of those ideas. And so it's very diverse, but it has a lot of things. Um, I didn't put the link there, so I might have to need to share that. but. Um, it was very useful when it came to just a quick place to go, well, what do we need for science? What do we need for physical education? What's the best? So for especially schools that are in distance learning, this might be a really good, useful Padlet um, just to get ideas, but also to um, share within your learning community. Um, so then a next use of Padlet that I had was um, in our maker space at um, Eunice Hanoi. Uh, Kids come in and I wanted to be able to see who's doing what, when they're doing it, how they're doing it. And with MYP, we wanted to make sure that we followed, you know, the, the necessary steps of the planning and then doing and then the reflections. Um, so what we did was we started off with a Padlet that um, in the right column starts off with the introduction. And then as students pick, they, got, they explored all the different technologies. Uh, they picked everything from Sphero to coding. Uh, one student wanted to make a Makey Makey controller, which is happening in the video right now. Another student wanted to use fonts to create like um, uh, an actual art piece. Uh, people use Scratch, people use code.org. And so I wanted the students to pick a project that would be something building on a skill or a passion that they have. And so they connected it to an SDG or they found an audience. This project was a student made a game where you like clicked on plastic bags in the ocean to collect them so you could buy plastic to make goods. Uh, that project was uh, artificial intelligence with music. We'll talk about those. Another one did like a Lego um, green screen project. And so there was a lot of projects where this is student driven entirely. And um, yeah, that was a Minecraft one. And then another student did a podcast and by the end of it, I realized I wanted to be able to make sure that the students could talk eloquently about the, their own growth within their projects. And so what we did was I wanted to have everyone make podcasts based on their reflections. And so they had to write a script. It was self and then peer reviewed. And Padlet was a place where we could vote. We could write comments. Um, it could have lots of feedback for all the students. There was voting opportunities for what is the coolest idea. Um, and it was totally a self-guided unit. It's a discovery unit we call iBlock. Um, but lots of student personalization. And then of course, reflection was consistent across all the projects. And even if a student didn't finish their projects, it was important that they could at least identify, well, this is where I could have planned better. This is where I could have grown more. This is where I should have not dreamt so big knowing my time frame. And I think that's really important, especially in the middle school um, for the students to learn about you know, self-management. So then um, I know I've gone over a bunch of things. So we're going to go to a quick Q&A. Um, if you have any questions so far, um, it's going to give us about three minutes and check to see if anybody has written anything in the chat. It is quiet. 
but um, I have gone through a lot of content. Um, yes, let me see. Let me grab that. And so this is the discovery wall. And so people should be able to see all the different technologies. And so with the online resources, uh, Spheros, uh, Makey Makey, fantastic. Uh, media creation is also a very useful column. Um, even if you don't have a 3D printer, you can use the Tinkercad for 3D designing. And then actually there's places that you can actually send off to have it 3D printed. Um, and of course, video production. If you're doing podcasting, all the students on our project actually use Anchor, which was fantastic. And there's also um, a great application uh, called, where is it? Oh yes, Avia. So uh, AIVA, uh, it's a music generator. This is a website that actually is allowing you to create um, music using artificial intelligence. Um, but we'll be talking about those in a second. Looks like we might have had enough time. So let's see, any chats? Okay, so um, uh, let's see. Uh, I want to create an online gallery for my students and we'll perhaps use Padlet like your discovery wall. Any suggestions? Yeah, um, so Nomer, uh, I would say that it's probably really good to think about priorities. So like, let's say, um, Let's say I have a session with, oops, stop, go back. Um, if let's say once I have, I mean, you can take something like I've already created and literally copy it, but um, definitely think about the columns, have it be different things. Usually have the most popular things to the left, but let's say I have a session with some students where I talk about online resources. What I would do is literally, I would just grab this column and I would move it over to the right, or I'm sorry, the left. And it seems to not wanna move right now. Okay, but yeah, and so what would happen is I'd always be shuffling columns to the left to make sure that um, it, they're always the first thing you see when you log in. And when you look at the scale of a Padlet, when you zoom out all the way, you can kind of see which columns have the most content. And I always like to think, you know, always have a tutorial on what it is that you want them to do. They always have clear instructions. Being able to color code in Padlet is always gonna be exceptional. And then being able to transfer things, copy things, um, and making sure people have the ability to uh, be able to comment and vote, I think is really good for student feedback. So I definitely would recommend doing that. Uh, Mary, uh, would you like to unmute? and? Ask your question, please. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Yeah, uh, I uh, this is quite interesting. I have used Padlet once or twice, but then uh, uh, I kind of got stuck because uh, it was just there. Okay, me and my uh, my, my students. Uh, later on, if I want to connect it to, like, uh, do we give rights to, I mean, is it possible to give rights to, like, parents also to come and watch and observe what they're, uh, what their uh, students are doing, what their children are doing, uh, or right. uh, uh, my coordinator, uh, like the kind of work that I'm doing. Is that also possible here? Yeah, so what you can do is um, you can set it to be visible to uh, public. Everyone can see it. Uh, that I would not have student information on there, of course. Um, you can have it private, which is, um, it's only for people who have been invited. Uh, unlist, yeah. And then secret is basically it's password protected. 
So if okay. it came to parents and student information, like student faces and videos, okay. I would definitely have it password protected. So okay. that way it's only shareable with parents. Now, what if a project is, uh, uh, it's, I have given a, a 15 day project okay. and uh, each student is able to look into what the other person is doing. But right. won't that be, uh, I mean, uh, won't they copy? Well, I, I mean, where is my originality then? Like if I am student A and I know what student uh, 10 is doing and uh, how would no that 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 needs to be a little more defined isn't it yeah and so when i talk about the peer checking i ask them you can you can borrow ideas but i need to see your originality i need to see what you've done to make it yours and so you know if a student so does padlet give that kind of uh, uh, a grid where uh, 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 i mean then you will have to keep monitoring them all the time isn't it yeah, and but uh -huh. so, but what's great is um, for let's say the um, let me go back to my presentation. So for the Makerspace project board, what I did was I had students create their first card, and literally I would move them over to a needs work, ready to go, keep going, green is good, yellow needs work, red you need to come talk to me. So color coding that Padlet really made students visually like I just had it on the screen in the middle of the classroom so I could mm -hmm. see who was doing what when and where and who needed help mm -hmm. um, as I was walking around the room as well okay so then you are uh, so then the teacher gets to be uh, instantaneously involved all the time uh, yeah uh -huh, I like that thank you yeah yeah of course okay. uh let's just uh, check to see if there's any other questions and then we'll move forward if not da, da, da. Great question. Thank you, Mary. Okay. So we left off on Makerspace. Oh, um, Tyler asks, are there are these tools on your Padlet more suitable for elementary, middle, or high? Um, you know, Tyler, that's a great question. I when it comes, this is more focused on middle school because that's probably where I spend a majority of my time. High school usually has set platforms already. But if a student needs support in a technology that isn't available normally in a class, it's already on the Padlet. If an elementary student is curious about what's coming up in middle school, I'd love them to see what's happening. So um, Neil Clark is our elementary school uh, tech innovation coach. And so he and I kind of collaborate sometimes and talk about like, well, in grade five, they do this skill of encoding or make do and building. Where do they go from there? And then talking about, well, should when should when is too early to expose a child to a technology that is going to be their gift and their medium to communicate in? It's never too early to have exposure to, um, but at least having it curated, like the content usually is pretty user friendly. So I would say up to that's why um, the session I would definitely say three grade three and above is safe for this kind of a Padlet um, because the kids have access to the same YouTube videos tutorials on how to create a three D printed something. So yeah, that's definitely something to think about. Um, but yeah, if you have any more questions, um, maybe we can talk about just curating content. Okay, so uh, next. So now we're going to start delving into artificial intelligence. Um, some people think that's a big scary word. I think it's actually kind of fun um, because artificial intelligence is just a simple way of describing a really complex program that uses a lot of data to choose things based on a programmer. And so it's only as good as the programmer's intent and it's only as good as the data. So um, one thing, uh, if you click on the Padlet, uh, let me put that into the chat. This is a Padlet that I made just for artificial intelligence because I want uh, my teachers to be aware of what's coming in the future. And so, when you're like, okay, well, what is coming in the future? Well, there's a lot of crazy stuff, but it's kind of fun. Um, and I'll talk about some of those. Actually, I might open that one up. But with artificial intelligence, it really comes down to, you know, anything that has a program, anything that has data can be influenced by artificial intelligence. And so to think about how the future is going to be affected or how a lot of different industries are, will be affected um, because of artificial intelligence. We wanna make sure these students are aware of it 
aren't afraid of it, have influence over it, and know that any interest, curiosity they have will have an opportunity for them to build something. And so a class I taught, um, one of my students said, well, Mr. Mack, I, I, I wanna study like poem and literature, um, poems and literature. I don't think artificial intelligence is going to impact that. And then we looked it up and found out, oh, wow, there's actually a lot. Um, and so it really comes down to, again, the data. Um, there's awesome connections to real life. And so let me talk about some of those and then, uh, then talk about the ethics, which I think is probably one of the most important things um, that comes out of uh, this presentation. Definitely we need to have the students be a part of this conversation. So if you go to the Padlet that I shared, uh, the first column will be research websites. So this is um, using a lot of Google experiments. They've been doing some great work and always very public about it. Um, there's a slide here that shows the differences between uh, machine learning, excuse me, um, and that's the more complex uh, programming. Uh, meanwhile, the artificial intelligence is just a kind of broader picture. If you look at um, some of the vocabulary, so let's see. So yeah, um, machine learning is more for the you know type of I'm sorry. Uh, machine learning is the ability for a machine or program to actually uh, make decisions based on a yes or no, and then the other different classes of answers. Um, there's also a slide here about the history of AI, which Definitely recommend if you're introducing this to your students, starting all the way in 1953 um, and 1956 when it was actually coined as a term, and then some of the most important events. Um, so which each column, it's devoted to a different impact with artificial intelligence. So um, first one is Google Quick Draw, I highly recommend, um, as especially elementary friendly. So the way, Google Quick Draw works is you actually are playing Pictionary with a computer. So it says draw a campfire. And so this is where I'm like, okay, we making But it doesn't know my fireplace. It's So it said fireplace, but not campfire. I was asking for radio. So when I think about okay, got radio. Elbow should be fun. How did it already know? Let's see. It knows parachute and garden hose. That seems hard. Uh, this is supposed to be a house. So when I first started using this, there were very simple images. And now it's actually more complex. And the reason why is because it's gotten better in the one year since I last taught this. It's a basketball. <laughs> no? Okay. And it's stumped. Okay. So if you've tried Quick Draw before, what happens is it guesses your images based on whichever. But so when we think about this elbow, my drawing of this elbow is compared to every other drawing of every other elbow anyone has ever played in this game. So the correct match would be anything that looks like this. Why is it always this side? And if you look at everybody's elbows that they've driven, drawn, usually it's going left or arm is going from the left to the right with the hand on the right. And why is that? Because, you know, I could have drawn it any other way. Um, when it came to campfire, this is what other people have drawn that was successful when it came to drawing a campfire. 
But these drawings are really just a comparison to every drawing that's ever been shared within this. Now with Google, they benefit by us using this, finding out how humans think about what composes an image, and then its image recognition becomes better. And so with its image re recognition, that is just a form of artificial intelligence where they just see, well, these lines equal this image and this image, because Google already knows what a campfire looks like. It already knows what an elbow looks like, but it wants to see what humans think uh, a, an elbow looks like. So that way we can, it can actually track to see how drawings are made. Um, so this one is, uh, it's a TensorFlow uh, sketch artificial intelligence where you can, can pick literally anything. Uh, this is really great with the younger groups to teach them how to draw a bird. So I would start with a circle and it gives me recommendations on how to draw a bird based on its own movement. So it says, okay, well, this is how you draw the bird. If you want, I'm gonna draw a bigger head. And it says, okay, well then you need a beak. Okay, thank you, I'll draw a beak. Oh, I need feet, that's right, thank you, feet. And so it's giving me suggestions on how to draw a bird based on the lines that I draw and making suggestions. Um, so that's all drawing. Uh, music is fantastic. There is an Avia music generator that I was talking about earlier. Literally all you do is plug in your style of music, um, beats per minute, uh, the tempo, and it'll produce original pieces of work. Semiconductor is a great one. Uh, this one is used to conduct an orchestra using your browser, um, using your camera, so your movements. Um, music teachers especially love it. Um, the infinite drum machine down here is pretty fun because it's literally just taking a bunch of crazy sounds and putting them all together. Uh, here are some articles about how it's an AI is used in the environment to help uh, clean water and organize plant growth. Uh, this was a fun one. It was uh, called Scroobly. And basically what it does is it uses uh, your camera to be able to uh, track your movement as a cartoon. And so uh, the videos are usually pretty short. I don't know if the streaming is gonna work as well because I'm uh, Zoom presenting at the same time. But if you go to scroobly.com, uh, you can first turn on the camera, you pick which uh, cartoon you would like to be. I'm gonna try this one. It then places that image on top of who you are. And so literally as I'm waving, this is just tracking to my movements. And so literally, as I hold up my hand, the avatar holds up its hand, I can turn that camera off and then do a recording. And so uh, we did this, uh, we used it for a dance unit where students had to create their own dance, but they didn't have to show a video of them, they just got to show a cartoon instead. So super fun. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna turn that off because it is taking bandwidth. Um, so these are a bunch of different ones. Um, we're going to have a moment where we take a break and try out some of these. Um, this is the last one I'm going to talk about before we talk about the ethics. Um, so this is Sam, which is the first virtual politician uh, in New Zealand. They have a virtual politician that literally you can have a survey with, kind of like a chatbot, but also um, it conducts surveys. It tracks social media. And what it does is it collects all those ideas and then presents it to humans to say, hey, those citizens care about these topics and these things. I think you should do this. And then the humans then proceed into legislation to see if that is something that they should actually do. And it's kind of powerful. Uh, that's, it's crazy to think like that's a thing, but it certainly is active and it's pretty popular actually. And then we think about like, well, are, does it have true representation because does it represent the people who talk online the most or the people who talk or does it represent everyone equally? So when we think about artificial intelligence, there's, there's obviously a lot of impacts. Um, when we think about, well, something silly, this is a song by, uh, it was for Eurovision. They created an artificial song 
or a song composed of all the different types of music and lyrics. And so it actually is a music, a song created by artificial intelligence. It's, comp it's a composition of every single song that's ever been done. Um, there is uh, also a billion songs, which creates original lyrics. But <clears throat> uh, for reading, I uh, really love this one. It's called uh, Talk to Books. And so what you do is you pose any question and you basically ask the library of books and it'll tell you where in what books this question could be answered. So talk to books would be like, what is the meaning of life? And so then we would actually start seeing where that shows up, meanings of life, the passions. It has quotes and literary references. Um, and so I definitely recommend if you're a language arts teacher, um, Definitely sharing that. But the, one of the first uh, points I wanted to make was how artificial intelligence is really just based on the users. It's, it's the programmers and the data. And so one thing, um, a trend we've noticed, or the world's noticed, is how artificial intelligence is being impacted by the data that's being used. And so sometimes there's a bias. So, uh, and one thing is either if your data set does include multiple different races um, or genders, sometimes it can be wrong and you don't want it to be wrong. So in this case, there was one that um, they found that uh, pictures showed that a female was a male based on a, a percentage or the confidence rates, which is supposed to be usually over 95%, at least 90%, if not over that. And so because there's all these cases of you know, artificial intelligence um, having a bias, but then not accurately being able to do what it's supposed to do. Um, we have now seen like uh, organizations like the Artificial Intelligence Justice League, the AJL. And what they do is they look at, well, what programs are being used? How accurate are they? And what representation needs to happen to make sure that they're fair? Um, in one of the articles I was reading, there is currently an artificial intelligence program used to calculate to see the confidence of will a inmate in a prison likely continue to commit a crime or not? And so um, because those are people's lives, if it has a bias, that's certainly going to be something that we want to make sure is balanced and fair. So this organization actually researches different um, programs and organizations and seeing how it works and is it fair based on how people are uh, using those programs. So, um, and then one thing I definitely want to share is um, the United Nations is in the process of creating a center for artificial, artificial intelligence and robotics in the Netherlands. And so this is where, this is where the conversation starts, talking about how do we create I don't want to say regulations, but at least some consistency so that way artificial intelligence can be used for positive good instead of negative. And um, definitely recommend that if you are teaching artificial intelligence that you think about those ethics and how we want our students to be on the right side of those decisions. So let's see. I know I've been talking for a bit. And so now let's kind of go into where we were in the presentation. Do, do, do. And again, if you have any questions um, about anything I've said, please put it into the chat. Uh, let's see. Okay, so um, so I wanted to give you about ten minutes, um, if you haven't already, to go through the um, AI um, artificial intelligence discoveries uh, padlet. I'll put it in the chat just to make sure people have it. And then I'll start answering questions. Just a second. Hope everyone's doing well today. Okay, so please explore. Um, I'm going to check some of these questions, and then we will move forward in about ten minutes. Not even. I've been talking for a bit. Okay. Uh, it's possible you to share the link in the Padlet. Sorry. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mary, 
Uh, like, yeah, uh, as, an, as an educator, as a teacher, like I am middle school, high school, I also take the DP. Yes. Uh, uh, most of my students, let me be very frank, are uh, much more IT savvy and much more they ex explore. They have, they have the interest and the passion to explore. Okay, so uh, being an educator yourself, uh, what do you think we need to be cautious? There, 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 there is a limit, right? We need to be cautious about uh, allowing them to use and also um, uh, so that uh, uh, there is a, a grid. We can't just allow or, or, or how do how is it uh, as an educator? Yeah, but, so, so it's one of those things when I was growing up as a kid, I, I grew up without a computer. I was fine. But then I grew up with a computer and I was like, well, I can I had learned shortcuts and how to hide my screen and minimize in front of my teacher. So I know the students, you know, they think they're clever. Um, one of my favorite things is whenever a student, uh, you know, a teacher walks around the room and then the students have learned how to swipe their screen away so they can be on something else. So they can be playing a game and then on something that's exactly. academic. You, you, right. you just caught me where I was, yeah. Yeah, and so so one of those things that I tell them is like, so nobody ever needs to you A S D unless they're playing a game. No, no one just does this with one hand because those are you can't make that many words. So I know you're not on task. Or I love to say, students, did you know that there's a reflection of a game in or a YouTube video in your glasses? And they're like, really? I was like, no, but you obviously don't see that. So it, it's. There's a little bit of a teacher intuition, but I think when it comes to, like I've had students copy and paste uh, programming from another website into their program or into a game that they made. And then when I'm like, wow, that's really cool. Tell me where you did this. And they're like, oh, uh, um, let me find it. And I was like, oh, you don't remember coding that, that mm -hmm. part of the game? Mm -hmm. And so this is where I think we need to be Self-reflection is important because the student has to track their own progress. A peer reflection, students know the, each other. Mm -hmm. And that's where, those are usually where some of the flags come up. But then when I look at it, I like to just think of what is the most specific question that only someone who actually did it would know. Exactly, yeah. That right. would uh, kind of prove the authenticity. Right, and so this is where like, you know, if you think about it, in the future, um, very soon, or if not already, um, you'll be able to scan a textbook, use all the content in that textbook, put in original pieces of your own writing, and a program will be able to spit out an original piece of work that you can't even identify as plagiarism. That's, that's, that's coming. Uh -oh. So then the question is, well, can a student eloquently recreate the same thing live on paper? And so that's where it comes down to consistency. Can a mm -hmm. student be consistent? Because mm. if because if they're if they're cheating, if they're finding a way around it, one time, sure. But as long as we have multiple checkpoints, we'll always be able to see that consistency, and that's the only measurable way of tracking student learning, if you ask me. Okay, so then un unknowingly we are always on guard. Yeah, isn't it? We we yeah that that isn't that a little grim and a little so scary. But it's I, I give the students the benefit of a doubt because it you know as long as they'll always have multiple different teachers that assess in different ways there will always be ways of checking their knowledge making sure they actually know what they're talking about and you know but even when we were kids you know people would try to sneak things past teachers that's just a part of education oh yes 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 that, that yeah. that's yeah that is part of yeah okay. thanks yeah, Susan thank you great question. Um, so, Carla, thank you. Yep, um, I love being curious. Uh, Sarah, this has been amazing. It's so informative. Can't wait to explore the Padlets. Yeah, totally. And copy them, borrow them. Welcome to them. Mary, um, according to teachers need to be cautious. Yep, uh, using artificial intelligence. Um, yes, uh, Adam, I will get a presentation. I had a little share error button, but I'll definitely put it in there by the end. Um, you're very welcome, Margaret. An example of mathematics in high school. Um, 
Ah, wow. Actually, mathematics is probably one of the harder ones because um, I can tell you mathematics is huge in the why we need good programmers. Um, I had one here. It's an article about uh, why math is important in the career of artificial intelligence. So definitely a good read. And then this one, I forget. Let me look at it. Oh, okay. So yeah, so Carnegie Learning had a program where basically it's like students sign up for this math program. They get support. Then literally as you're going through their program, I mean, um, what it does is it actually tracks student progress to identify what students are missing to make predictions on what they should learn. So like they'll do a test and if they were slower for trigonometry and these certain parts, it'll create a tutoring program based on what support they could use. And so it's very individualized learning that actually would be really useful for students who don't wanna just have to repeat the same thing a hundred times. It, that, the program will actually create paths, learning paths that are independent and unique to that student. So yeah, um, and especially with uh, high school, they, their, their resilience and their patience to be frustrated when learning is usually a little bit lower than when they're a little kid and they're curious. So yeah, but um, definitely something I've been looking into. I don't know how good it is, but um, something I, I thought it was a cool idea that does exist. Um, okay, so yeah, shared Padlet. Um, thanks for sharing with us, it's interesting. Uh, can you also link to the EdTech resource? Oh, uh, EdTech resource, yes. Um, I forget what it's called now. Uh, Joran, can you write uh, which resource? Is it the distance learning or was it the discovery wall? Because if it's discovery wall, I can have that listed here. And then if it's distance learning, then I'll have to grab it. Uh, Tyler asks, uh, if you use Google Classroom, can you use a uh, Chrome extension Classwork Zoom for Google Classroom to track student progress? Uh, that I don't know. I've not played with that specific extension, but I think that um, you know, as long as you have some kind of way of tracking, we use Hapara at our school. And we can see live what students have on their screens, what tabs they have open to make sure they're on task. Um, it's kind of like a virtual walking around the room, especially useful in uh, online learning. Okay, so um, just being uh, mindful of time, I got about 15 more minutes and I have a couple more slides. Uh, let me just go back into that. Okay, uh, just a moment. Okay, so when, um, one of the things, so this presentation is called Future Technologies. So one of the questions I posed to my high schoolers last school year was, if you had to think about what industries or what degrees or um, professional pursuits you wanna have in university or in, as a career, what is artificial intelligence doing right now with that career? And what could it be doing in 10 years if you had influence over it? And so with that class, we started with, well, here's the biggest AI tech companies that have billions of dollars worth of funding almost immediately that have only been around for the past three to five years. And as students were realizing, oh, you can start a company from nothing. Like you can have a startup. You can just get money for just coming up with a cool idea. And I said, yeah, that's the world we live in. And so students started by look at researching companies then researching trends within artificial intelligence. They then did a unit on programming and um, the resource, the platform that they use because Padlet's great for just quick, easy posting. But this is what, um, uh, what I call Super Padlet, it's called Trello. And Trello is a way of having, you can have uh, check boxes, you can have assignments, it connects to Google. I, again, with the same columns tracks their progress. It has images, there's voting, there's comments, there's linking, and it is just so powerful when it comes to project management. So literally as they have a, I don't wanna say a design cycle, but they have a process or further project. They have to do the research and they have to put it together. Then there's some collaboration. 
and it all builds to a presentation. And so literally all these cards are movable between these columns, tracking students across all my classes. So everyone can see who, what, who's doing what, what they're studying, what ideas they have, and it's very transparent. And so um, we did a research project talking about the trends. Eventually they had to then come up with predictions on what AI could do with their career in 10 years. And those are the questions that those are the projects that really surprised me because they don't know the limitations of the world they've grown up in because they're much younger than a lot of us. But they can, it's almost like science fiction. Science fiction is real when it happens. So if they don't know it that can't exist, they'll, they're going to try to make it. And so um, we have lots of examples like Emoji Scavenger Hunt is just image recognition, uh, super fun for the little kids. You just have them run around with tablets or phones to try to find an emoji in real life. Um, but I, you know, everything from dentistry to veterinary care to um, child psychology was a fantastic project. A student was talking about how um, artificial intelligence could be used to understand and track a student's growth, health, you know, uh, overcoming trauma. And I was like, wow, that's really cool. Um, another one talked about how artificial intelligence could be used to design a better airplane that's more aerodynamic and use uh, better materials. So after we think about what the students think can be future technologies, they then had to create a program. And so they used a program called Teachable Machine. A Teachable Machine is a, it uses images, motion tracking, and sounds to just create groups of things before it then allows you to just make those comparisons. So that's what we're going to do next. Um, but first, I just want to check in and make sure there isn't any new questions. So let me just check. Uh, let's see. I've got Discovery Makerspace links, but I think there's another one called EdTech Resource Wall. OK, um, so I'll look for that one, Joran and Tyler. There's so many awesome tools. Oh, yes, thank you, Kristen. Uh, Draftback is also a tool to use after, after the work has been done. Uh, Donna, can you expand on that? Um, I'm not familiar with it. Uh, yeah, Draftback is a tool that is a Google extension that you add to Chrome, and it allows you to see the work that a student has written in a Google Doc, and you can play it at um, normal speed, so you can see how they have typed it. You can also see them cutting and pasting things in because oh. a large chunk of text that come in. You can also play it at fast speeds and it renders a document so that you can replay it kind of as a live little video. It's a really cool okay. tool. Um, we use it at Eunice uh, for the extended essays whenever we have some uh, concerns that teachers have raised. We right. don't run it with every student uh, because it would take way too much time. Um, right. But when uh, the teacher has that 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 niggly little feeling yeah. going, I think that this is not the work, then we uh, will pull it up. Right. No, that's a, an excellent point because, you know, it's one of those things we want to make sure that we're at least a step ahead of some of the um, some of the things that the students could potentially try to move past this, right? Um, thank you for that. Uh, so someone was share, asking about the ed tech resource wall. I posted that in. Again, this is a collab. This is combined with a bunch of different projects. So um, I think I forget who all made it, but uh, I definitely added some things to it. Some great things on here is uh, virtual field trips. Definitely recommend that. Um, uh, with our language units, um, with languages, uh, we had students students created uh, superheroes. And so this is uh, Marvel HQ allows you to create your own superhero. And they had to describe it in different languages in Spanish. Uh, Blabberize is fantastic. I use it at least once a year. Um, basically, you just upload a picture. You pick where the mouth goes. And then as you record your audio, the mouth moves like a puppet. It's kind of amazing. OK, um, let me check to see. Okay, got it. Awesome. All right. So moving right along. Um, so uh, last thing we were going to do is talk about Teachable Machine. 
Uh, so with Teachable Machine, it's uh, again, images, cameras, or sounds. Uh, there's no coding needed. As you can see in this uh, screen, we, uh, we did a project where we had to create a Teachable Machine that could identify if you're wearing a mask correctly or not. So students had a correct, an incorrect, and then, well, uh, wearing a mask, not wearing a mask, and then wearing a mask incorrectly. Now, when we did this, um, as you can see, the wrong, the correct, and not wearing a mask surgically is jumping all over the place. It's not working correctly. And so if you go to this bit.ly, you can actually go to the Google Drive and actually open it up on your own. Um, and you can literally copy it. But with the students, we noticed that because they were the category of wearing a mask incorrectly was uh, confusing the image recognition, what we'd have to do is we had to disable that category to adjust are, is, are you wearing the mask correctly or are you wearing it in, or no mask at all? And then it was able to identify with like a 90% accuracy and confidence that yes, it's being worn correctly. Um, but all you do is you just create the different classes. You just upload your images or your data or your examples. You then train your, your program. And then literally you can see the results almost you know, in minutes. Um, this is something that you can use in elementary all the way through high school, just to talk about concepts. Um, in my uh, previous high school class, we had students create, uh, are you doing a push-up correctly? Um, what kind of soda, what kind of sugar coated is in a soda based on the different types of labels? We had, um, one student was like, is it a MBA designed basketball or something else? Um, we had um, one student created a program that was like, is it me or anybody else? And so he had pictures of him in every different degree and then pictures of anybody else. And then people who kind of looked like him was like somewhere in like the 75% range. So yeah, so it's very interesting what the students will come up with. Um, and it's super friendly. Uh, again, if you want to take a look at that, you can. And when we talk about facial recognition, we talked about bias. Um, we wanted to uh, make a project because when we started, uh, when we started uh, uh, being on campus, one of the things was we couldn't. Parents weren't allowed to come on campus as regularly as we'd like them to, and so we thought, well, we need to give parents an opportunity to see what's happening on our campus. And so we started a project called Window into Unis, where we said, okay, if in one day, let's just grab video and pictures of everything that happens primary all the way through grade 12. And the end result was everybody just running around with cameras all day. Um, we had students, teachers, faculty, it was amazing. And so everyone just uploaded everything to a Google Drive folder. And thankfully I didn't have to edit, but we actually had another um, outside uh, organization do the editing for us. And we tried to compile all these different images together, but we were like, well, you know, we still have, you know, students who are on our no photo list. And potentially they could be in this video. And so how do we make sure we're good stewards of that policy? So Vitagami is a, a software that's used to store school memories. And so we're actually using it right now to try to scan to see where are those no photo students so that way we can make sure that they're not included in the video incorrectly. And so this is where it's facial recognition, it's artificial intelligence, but it's also allowing us to have parents be able to see what's happening on campus without um, you know, misusing the policies that we've already installed. So that's just one of the examples um, how we're using it at the school ourselves. Um, I'm certainly not the person to talk about you know, Bidigami to a lot, uh, to a huge amount, but it certainly was a fun project and certainly loved uh, having that opportunity. So uh, with the last four minutes, not really, um, Maybe it might just be uh, people being able to um, uh, post if they like. Um, I was going to have you tell me, what do you think are some of the technologies that we didn't discuss? I know robotics um, is a big one, 3D printing, are future technologies that we could spend days on. Um, but if there's any um, technologies that should belong in the discovery wall that you don't think are there, um, I'd be curious what you had. If you have any questions, please post them. Um, it's been a lovely session, uh, but I do want to be mindful of time. So we have about three more minutes. Hello, Cecil. Yes. 
uh, have you tried the uh, Flipgrid and Padlet together? The combination it, it works very well. Yes, and and it's one of those things. What I love is um, how easy. So we use Google Google Sites, and how all of that can be embedded so beautifully in Google Sites. But yeah, we're uh, connecting those two is great because you get the video, but you also get um, that organization piece with Padlet. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay. Please unmute and share. Thanks so much, Cecil. Um, yeah, as we as we come to a close here, I just want to extend a thanks to you. I think we can all see through your session um, why you're an innovation coach, <laughs> and uh, I know that at Eunice Hanoi, we're very very fortunate to to um, to have you there and to work with you. I, I'm your colleague, and I'm using a, an app I learned from you on the on the next uh, job like session, which is called Mural. Co, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, which is really great for collaborating online um, with what you do normally with like flip charts and things like that. So it's uh, just so many things to explore, so many insights. Thank you so much. And uh, everybody, there's there's Whova as well. So um, what we'll do is we'll also post some of these links on the uh, session uh, in that uh, kind of chat area. And then if you have any uh, follow up questions or anything like that, uh, so do feel free to post there. Uh, Cecil and, and other presenters will be online. Yeah, and thank you all for coming. It's been a cool session and uh, hopefully have a wonderful day. Have a great conference. <laughs>